Unfortunately, you've got shadow on the target, but we can still see. Yeah, we'll still, you can still see it. I can still make it out. Oh, just left bottom oh. corner, dust. Wow, that was close. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was close. That was definitely a neater yeah. two inch bigger target and that was <laughs> gone. Yeah. Wow, that was G'day, good. welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Today, um, as the title of this video suggests, I want to talk about the best calibre, guess cartridge for ELR. Um, and I qualify that comment um, by saying the question isn't, or the the, the answer, the, you know, the question, what is the best ELR calibre, is not necessarily the question people think it is. Yeah. The basics, what most people are looking at is what can shoot the furthest, the most accurately, the most consistently, what is the best at doing that. Um, and the normal, the common thought, the common rule of thought, comes a little bit into bigger is better. Not completely, uh, but there's a fair bit of, um, in the natural, in the, the basic maths of ballistic coefficients on bullets, which is a very important thing with the ELR, um, is that the bigger the bullet, the heavier the bullet, the better the coefficient, um, the, the ballistic coefficient, the more energy it's going to carry, the longer it's going to travel through the, through the air, so the better it'll be. And there is some, some credence to that, um, there is also, oh, if you've got a bigger cartridge, yeah. so you've got more power, so you've got more muzzle velocity, um, <laughs> you're going to then, everything's going to hold up better. Yeah. So by the maths of everything, there is a little bit of bigger is better. Um, there's another side to that, and that is the fact that we're not talking about artillery, we're not talking about bolted down things, we're talking about a human operating it. And we're also talking about a, talking about a rifle that isn't built on site to where the, you can you take it there on trucks and, and yada yada. I'm getting a bit carried away there. But what I'm saying is the format of what you've got and what you're shooting is relevant. So those are two obvious things and there's then becomes a little bit of a balance that you're playing. But we still have a fair bit of talking about big rifles um, and big calibers with lots of power being the best for ELR. Um, I would say there's another whole equation to put into that. There's another whole thing to put into that. And that is um, in the concept of what ELR is and what it actually is doing, what, what it actually is. I did a video recently about practical applications. Um, and there is practical applications in a military sense which are limited for real ELR, real ultra long range and extreme long range shots. There are limited applications for that. But if we come back down to what most of us are actually doing, what we're really doing with ELR shooting. There's a little bit in competition, so that's relevant. Oh, There's a lot of people a person pushing their own personal limits and a lot of people having fun with what they're doing. So there lies some things that are very big points to talk about and a couple of different angles to go. Um, the first one that I'd start with is in a very personal sense what um, your conditions, what you actually have, where you're actually shooting yeah, in your life. Just directly behind the so plate. if you really are trying to push your boundaries and you want to have the fun and you want to do a lot with um, with experiencing what ELR shooting is, but you really only have one mile or, or two miles or, or sorry, one mile or, or 2,000 yards or two and a half thousand yards is really what you have to shoot with. Then your best ELR cartridge is not one of the big hitters because um, really two and a half, if you're going to get yourself a 375 shy tack very popular round in the larger cartridges um, and shoot two and, and can only shoot two and a half thousand yards um, listen, as much as that'll be challenging for a while, once you get it all sorted out and done, you're able to hit your target with still supersonic, and don't get me wrong, it's still long range shooting, um, and it still takes skill and all the rest of it, but in the way of true ELR shooting, you're sort of overdoing it. It's, and I suppose to a degree, your expected result versus what you probably will achieve um, is always pushing Joel, yourself Joel, Joel. Um, with Joel. with frustration through the fact you're not quite achieving what you wanted to because it has its own limitations. Whereas you come back down into a lot smaller cartridge 
let's say something, and I'm not suggesting anything in particular, but you came down to a seven mil rem mag or something like that, um, then all of a sudden two and a half thousand yards can take, there's a lot more going on. The bullet's slowing down a lot more, there's a lot less energy. Um, not quite as simple as, as just that. There, there is some benefits to shooting that smaller one because it's got less recoil, something I'll go into in a little bit. Um, there's some negatives to the fact of what your conditions are matter a lot. Now, one of the things on a video I did a while ago, which I mentioned was bigger isn't always better. Um, one of a fair, fair few comments came back of when I'm shooting 1200 yards or 1300 yards at the grassy bank that I shoot targets at is that the bigger calibers, the 300s, the 338s, the 375s are a lot easier to see the splash because they're shooting into grass. And they're absolutely right. Oh, when you I'm start not, shooting, well, when your conditions yes, are, your light, what your actual impact zone is, where you're actually trying to shoot, um, it can be very frustrating, nigh and impossible in some circumstances to actually get onto target to work out what's going on with everything with you and, and getting it set up. If you're shooting into an area where you get very little feedback and then you start to go Dust with a big calibre because of what your conditions are. Um, and it all needs to be kept in mind. So two and a half thousand yards into a green grassy paddock is very hard work to do to a degree, no matter how big the calibre, unless you're going into artillery, you can't see stuff that goes disappearing into Drop tall right green grass. Dust, um, and you can't, bullet trace and things like that doesn't work in bullets that have gone subsonic. Um, apart from extreme long distance, it gets hard to stay in focus for, for, for what your bullet trace is. So it becomes extremely complicated. So what I'm actually leading into with that is that Hit, you can shoot ELR of a form with a 22 in the right sort of condition. So a 22 long rifle, you can actually pull off all sorts of <laughs> weird extended shots with the right conditions. Um, and every caliber up from there can still work really well for you in the way of what your conditions are and what you're trying to see. Once you start to go into the subsonic range, which is where I consider ELR really starts, and yeah. deal with different wind zones and that sort of stuff, you can really take something like a 6.5 Creedmoor and shoot out to 2,000 yards, and it's becoming complicated and takes skill and takes effort to get to that place. Um, and that's then something sure, that the requires more, uh, I suppose, what am I trying to say? There's a little bit more <laughs> of a nice feeling you get out of and, and a sense of achievement you get out of pushing a smaller cartridge a long way than taking a big cartridge and achieving the same result. Um, to the point where all of a sudden you have to find that you have to print a nice group on a 18 inch target at 2000 yards with your 338 to feel like you're doing the right thing with it because of the distance you're actually shooting versus the caliber. So that's one angle to go with saying that it isn't always specific on the size of caliber and the type of bullet you're going to be shooting to create what the ELR experience is. Once you get around the fact you've got good area you can shoot a long way um, and you go to really there's no limitations on how far you're going to shoot um, you've got good conditions you can see things on whatever format you're doing um, then it's about how um, uh, really how far you can shoot accurately um, given all those bits and pieces that are involved both your conditions your weather your ground your um, shooting platform all the rest of it um, and you'd think that moves more into you can just shoot a bigger caliber um, and certainly I have done that sort of thing. I oh, shoot with a bigger calibre, um, wow. but I'd have to say there's some questions that rise in that. that One of the main ingredients you're dealing with um, is you have, um, with a larger calibre, with a very efficient bullet, um, so you're generally talking about, let's say the, the 375 shy tac is probably the, the lower end of that range, um, then the, four, the, the 408, the 416, the um, you know, up into the 50s. And there's lots of different permutations and wildcats and things that go in amongst all that. And the simple logic is you're running a very efficient monolithic bullet, um, a lot of powder, 120 to 200 odd grains of powder. So a lot of energy, good muzzle velocity, high muzzle velocities um, with a very efficient bullet. It's the simple logic of it. That's right. Um, if you keep inside the brackets of it is a man-fired rifle, so it is not bolted down a platform, 
then you still have a human, a, an average piece running in the back of the rifle. And if you keep back into the brackets of you have a rifle, which is not a three-man thing, so it's not a 100 kilo or 200 pound rifle or anything like that, come back down to a normal rifle format, let's say somewhere between the 20 pounds and the 40 pounds of rifle. Um, then you have a, a enormous amount of inertia to deal with by accelerating even as small as a 350 grain bullet, right, but let's say more slow, average in the 400 to right, 400 odd grain bullet. Slow. You have an enormous amount of um, inertia being created by the fact you're taking that 400 grain bullet and accelerating it from nothing to 3,000, 3,200, 3,400 feet per second at the end of a 30 to a 40 inch barrel. That is an enormous amount of opposite energy pushing the rifle backwards. The more energy you've got shoving the rifle backwards, the more movement's going to happen oh, during that process. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that inertia right. starts here and is accelerating all the way at the barrel. You end up with a few thou of movement at the back of the rifle that is not consistent. Um, that ends up with a few meters of movement at the other end of where the target is, or where your point of impact is. So the simple logic of that is keeping the rifle movement down to a minimum is obvious, and we do all sorts of things with bipods, uh, whether be it F-Class or be it various form of bipod designs with setting up your chassis, with setting up your butt pad, with setting up all the bits and pieces to make this cycle really well, and we do the job as well as we can as a human. But if there is less movement, then there is less we have to do in the way of providing that consistency, so the more likelihood of consistency. And the best way to create that is with less inertia. So there is a degree, uh, and it is very obvious to me in shooting some ELR stuff with little calibers, as much as I'm Don't dealing right, with more conditions in wind and, and things like that, there's more time for the bullet or the bullet's pushed around a little bit more, there's definitely that factor. The, yeah, okay. ease of yeah. the ease of shooting is so notable when you're in that situation that it does come into the fact of that balance, um, it should be thought about. It should be something that really should be considered. Um, I tend, when I'm looking around and I'm thinking more about this, I tend to feel that there's some cartridge development that we can do which um, can hyphenate that even more, and that's coming down to probably, which I think is probably in the rear, in the maybe realistically achievable, but certainly um, realistic in the way of creating the iner keeping the inertia down, coming down to somewhere between a 200 and a 300 gram projectile um, that is traveling very quickly, that is going to end up being the better choice than going to the bigger caliber um, with a slightly better ballistic coefficient. Um, as said, there isn't too many calibers to, to, to some of the calibers that I can, can imagine don't exist. I don't know of them. Um, and it, it comes, a little bit of that logic comes from the likes of the 6.5 saw versus the 6.506, which is the long skinny versus the short fat, is how efficient that sort of round can be. If you can scale that up into a 7 mil or a 308 cartridge or a three, you know, like a, a 308 um, calibre, so somewhere in that sort of thing, a bullet that's in that sort of weight that then has very high velocity out of a very efficient cartridge, I have a feeling that the consistency and the ease of shooting, and I'm not saying trying to say it's going to be easy to shoot, but the consistency and ease of shooting in comparison to the dramas or the, 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 the difficulties and inconsistency of shooting one of the really big hitters will mean that that can become a more effective ELR cartridge um, to a degree. Um, there's, there is always factors to keep in mind with this, you know, with whether there is the conditions of what you can actually see, um, whether there is in the way of the ground you're shooting into, in the type of weather you're dealing with, um, in the format you're actually trying to perform. You know, I'm bringing it under the brackets of more in the world of us that are trying to achieve that, that challenge. We're trying to push those boundaries and we're trying to do that in a form of a, of a normal rifle form. Then I'm coming into that place in the way of my, my weights of, of bullets and the amount of energy I'm trying to push down the cartridge or push down the barrel. Um, 
But what I'm really trying to say, and the overall perspective of this of this video, is that it's not an obvious thing. There are choices where there are circumstances where as little as a 223 Remington will be something that's actually really effective to use for the conditions you have. And you have one mile you can shoot to and you want to push the boundaries of things, then that little cartridge, as ineffective as it may be by paper, if you've set your rifle up properly and that sort of stuff, then you can shoot out to those distances, 1,500 yards, one mile with a, two, with a 223. It sounds ridiculous, but in, in, a, in a real logical sense, there's no less illogical thing in that than trying to shoot um, two and a half or three miles with any rifle shot, with any with any actual yeah, rifle versus an artillery piece or something like that. Um, and the challenge of doing it and dealing with the winds and dealing with those things is just as uplifting to actually conquer it, just as frustrating and and compromising to not to, to be pushed around by and not get your job done but it really can come into and I'm not saying go and get a 223 I'm not saying go and get a piece of artillery what I am saying is if you work out in your conditions and go through things to where um, and that may well be I want to achieve 3,000 yards um, and I want to achieve that in pushing something to as far as it can then some saying something silly like a 6.5 Creedmoor which I have attempted that shot and I would say it's silly but it is conceivable it takes the effort and yet there's some there's some other reasons some less expense less going on the rifle more going on with what you're doing and trying to create um, and like I said there's a big balance and I could mention um, hundreds of cartridges and try and pick ranges for them it really comes down to so many details that the truth of it is there isn't any right answer. Um, there is the answer that suits you and your conditions, and you'll probably find there's three or four cartridges that fit into that nicely. Anyway, a couple of things I should finish off with. This rifle that's sitting in front of us um, is a great rifle. It isn't particularly an ELR rifle. Um, it's just a rifle that um, I've recently got this chassis, um, and I wanted to put something in rather than looking at my mug, um, that's something that everyone could look at. It is the MDT chassis um, in the a ACC chassis. It's a great chassis, nice and long, nice and stiff. Does the LR stuff quite well. I've just got a 308 police special sitting in here, which I've shot out to 2,000 yards, which is an ELR cartridge or an ELR shot in my consideration, well back into subsonic and well past where the effective range or even the logical range for the likes of a 308 but did it reasonably consistently and a nice thing to do. It also has on a scope that is good for the LR side of things. This is the Valdata, the Recon 2, um, 150 in two minutes of internal elevation, um, 30 power, very good glass, very small reticle in a first focal plane, which really suits the, the, the first focal plane. I'm not 100% um, good on the LR side of things. You can still use them without problems. This one's been done with the advantages that's super fine. So up in the high powers, still very usable, not in your face too much because it is a very fine reticle. Um, but there's just something to look at, like I said, great chassis, really stiff, nice long, so nice and stable, you know, set up in the 5R or whatever bipod you're doing, really nice system. The other thing I should say is the teaser on the front there or the pictures of those cartridges on the front of the, on the front page, uh, on the thumbnail to go with this video. None of those are real rounds, they're all, um, extrapolations of what rounds could be um, and the different styles which you can go whether that's the tall skinny short fat I'd have to say one that's building up with a thought in my head which I'm which I haven't done the maths with but properly and it really is going to be an R&D project if I take it on at all but is something like the seven millimeter round in a 195 grain bullet so in the bottom end of what I think is is so nice and light should be less energy involved with it, but setting up a cartridge in a short fat thing with a lot of energy and trying to get that into the higher ends of the 3000 feet per second. So that's the 3500 to 3800 feet per second. Um, if that is conceivable, which is another whole maths of if it's conceivable um, in the way of creating a cartridge that can create that sort of muzzle velocity out of that round. Yes, it'll have negatives and barrel life and all that sort of stuff. But if that's conceivable, that would be an amazing thing for ultra long range with low energy 
in a moderate way for rifle um, is just sort of part of the thoughts that come into my head when I start thinking about this and having this conversation and from where I've been in understanding that of how much work it takes to shoot those big ones um, and how easy it is to shoot the littler ones that you know maybe there's some thought to, to carry on down that road. Anyway guys that's a little bit of a chat I hope I wasn't um, stepping on my toes too much in that conversation uh, it made sense to people um, there isn't like I said there isn't specific answers for people who are saying what's the best DLR cartridge there's um, the, more to the point, all the answers you're going to find are specific to lots of details that you have in your environment and what you're likely to be doing. Anyway, thanks for checking in on us. Hi guys, Sam here. For folks that are interested in our products that you will have seen in our videos, these are all products that Mark has designed through our experience in ELR shooting. We manufacture them here ourselves. The likes of our adjustable bag bases, bag riders, bipod systems, muzzle brakes, shot data recording sets, and even our great fun little 22 long rifle target. These are all available in our web store, the links to which are below this video, along with our contact information. And guys, we work hard at putting these videos together, so we appreciate all the help we can get. For those of you who haven't subscribed, don't forget and hit the bell so you get notifications of when our videos come out. It would be awesome to get some financial support. So for those of you who can, you can purchase support bits on our web store which help us bring these videos to you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.